Welcome back. The business-backed think tank, the New Zealand Initiative, says councils should be given the power to create their own special economic zones to boost growth. It's the key argument in a new study on finding new ways to grow regional prosperity. The report also suggests councils should get a share of the taxes that come from that new growth too. The New Zealand Initiative's Executive Director, Oliver Hart, which joins me now. What do you want these economic zones to look like, first and foremost? Is the RMA and changing the RMA the first target? No, what this is all about is, is the realization that New Zealand is one of the most centralized countries in the developed world. 91 cents of every dollar of government spending, for example, are spent by central government, only 9% spent locally. The other thing is actually with that degree of centralization comes a degree of centralization of decision making. So we're often trying one size fits all policies designed in Wellington in Parliament and the Beehive and then applied across the whole country. We think we should actually try different policies and we should trial them out first on a smaller um, scale just doing it with one council at a time first and see whether these new policies actually work. If they work, great, we can actually copy this experience and we can roll it out across the country. If it doesn't work, of course the damage is limited to just this one council, but this way we could actually experiment with different policies. Give me an example, give me a real life example. Let's take the West Coast for example. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been hit, as we know, mine closures, unemployment. What would you do to the West Coast to make life better? What changes, first and foremost, would you do? Well. First of all, we know that um, when it comes to mining exploration, minerals exploration, um, New Zealand is a very difficult uh, place actually to navigate. We know that other places are much better when it comes to encouraging mining. Take a look at Australia, for example, have a look at South Australia in particular. And if the West Coast actually wanted to take an inspiration from that, they would be able to roll out that scheme. There would be no damage to the rest of the country. We could just see whether it works in the New Zealand context as well. If it works, of course, the West Coast would keep some of the extra proceeds of growth. They would keep some of the taxes generated. And then we could see whether we could try something similar across other parts of the country as well. The West Coast, though, of course, would be a, a, a loaded example in so much as you've got the conservation side of it. And I can imagine a lot of uh, other people are not going to like any changes that perhaps gave the green light to more mining or, 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 or more, uh, m more environmental impact. What do you say to that, though? Of course, but that is really the strength <coughs> of our approach because we're not imposing anything on anyone. We're actually asking local communities to make their own decisions. So this would be really government for the people, by the people and close to the people because we are actually strengthening local democracy and local communities could have their say in all of this. They could balance the economic um, growth opportunities with environmental concerns. Probably they could do it far better than a distant bureaucracy in Wellington. Stephen Joyce though says things in the regions are growing and going well. Why is this needed at all? Well some places could probably do with a bit more growth. Take a look at Wellington for example that was one of the regions that the Prime Minister said is not doing so well. Mm. If Wellington for example wanted to increase its foreign direct investment intake we could actually take Wellington out of the Overseas Investment Act. We could actually let the council decide whether they would like to be a bit more liberal about foreign direct investment because, um, frankly, we are not facing the kinds of uh, crafer farm or lock infestation um, problems in Wellington because there's not much farmland around. So Wellington would be the perfect place to try out a liberalisation of the Overseas Investment Act. OK, there appear to be three key points here. First of all, the RMA. Secondly, the Overseas Investment Act. And, and, and perhaps more dramatically, changing taxes province to province. The first one, I think the government would want, want to get rid of that red tape if possible as well, the RMA, wouldn't they? Well, the RMA is an act, of course, that's been with us for more than 20 years and over this time we've basically tried to reform it every single year with not much success. Mm. So we think rather than waiting for this faraway day where we get wholesale reform of the RMA, we could actually trial out some liberalisations locally. And I think the chances of that happening are far greater than waiting for this day when we actually get the reform that the RMA really needs. But it's not really about the RMA, it's about trialling out different policies. It could be about uh, the RMA, it could be about planning, it could be about immigration, it could be about all sorts of things. The key to all of this is really that we are enabling, we're empowering local communities to have their say rather than trying out one-size-fits-all policies which in the end often turn out to be one-size-fits-none. Is there a risk though that central government's going to say well it's all fine and well you're empowering local councils but that's taking power away from central government and they're not going to let it 
happen. Well, it could actually be a positive for central government as well, because we are talking about generating some kind of economic development, economic growth, with other, which otherwise would never happen. So in the end, we are talking about some deal between central and local government, whereby the proceeds of this extra growth would be shared between central and local, so there is a positive in it for both central and local government. Have you spoken to the governor? Have you spoken to Stephen Joyce? We've spoken to Stephen Joyce, we've spoken to other government ministers, we've spoken to the opposition, of course, we've talked to councils as well, and we see that there is a growing interest in these ideas. And, and, and the, yeah, the, first of all, Stephen Joyce, because he's the one who's going to yay or nay it, I guess, ultimately. W what's the reception been like? Well, I think what we're seeing with all of these politicians is actually a degree of curiosity about this idea because it's never been tried in New Zealand. It's something that's been tried elsewhere. There are 3,500 special economic zones around the world in 130 countries. The UK is currently experimenting with schemes that are really going in our direction. New Zealand, I think, is one of the laggards when it comes to introducing special economic zones. So therefore, I sense a degree of curiosity among our politicians to try out something like that here. One example as well that was given, and I'll try and break this down as, as best I can, if you make a region more attractive with, say, the RMA gone, more people are going to go there. If more people go there, more people are going to live there. If more people live there, that'll take the pressure as well off a housing market, say, like, oh, I don't know, Auckland. Is, is, is that going to happen or is that just too far down the pipe? No, that's exactly what we would like to see happen. The other thing, of course, we want to see happen is once you install a special economic zone in one place and it works, it's successful, other places in New Zealand should have an automatic right to get the same exemptions from national legislation as well. So the idea is not to create favours, not to really just single out a specific region and say, this is the region that we want want to grow and we're picking a winner. We actually want to find out what works. If it works, we can apply this experience to the rest of the country. Say something works in Wellington or in Auckland, then Dunedin should have an automatic right to say that's what we want as well. So ultimately, if some of these were to put in place, are you looking at attracting international business or just moving businesses that are already here out of the, out of the central cities and, and, and off to the regions? What, who are you aiming this at? We want to see more foreign investment, of course. We want to see more international business in New Zealand. And we want to make it easier for com companies that are already operating in New Zealand to grow. Because um, we're not picking any winners. We just want to create economic growth. We want to create growth for communities. And we want to experiment with different policies that we can then apply to the rest of the country. OK, so where to from here? What do you do next? You've got your book. You've got, the, got this here. And I imagine it's a fairly comprehensive report. What now? There needs to be more work to be done. There's more work to be done on actually designing the specifics of local government finance reform. That's another project that we are currently tackling at the New Zealand Initiative. And more broadly speaking, we need a debate about local government and about localism. Again, as I said, other countries are currently moving in the direction of having greater power for local communities. In New Zealand, we're still talking about a very centralised form of government. Mm. And I think this country needs to have a debate of, about the role of local government and its relationship to central government. The housing crisis in Auckland, we, we did touch on this before, do you really think this could go some way to addressing that? Absolutely, because part of the housing crisis, of course, is the crisis of delivering infrastructure. So we've got some ideas on how to incentivise delivery of new land for development by making it easier for councils to finance the infrastructure needed. For example, we had a previous report where we said we could probably earmark the GST paid on new developments and, and basically rebate that GST to councils so they can actually finance the required infrastructure for these new housing developments. We could also talk about relaxing, for example, some um, density or height regulations. We could just make it easier for a council like Auckland to deal with the challenges that come from a growing population. All right, thank you so much for your time.